Amen. That's right. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So, church, welcome. Good morning. We have the privilege, the opportunity, and the luxury of looking backwards at the resurrection. And we know how it ends. We know that Jesus rose from the dead, and we know that he will one day return. Amen? But can you imagine what it was like to be one of his earliest followers? I mean, think about that. On Saturday, they had just seen him crucified on the cross the day before, and they didn't know that he was going to raise on Sunday. It was almost like they were having that feeling of when you're in the hospital waiting room waiting to hear if your loved one is going to survive the accident or not. It just really happened. I'm waiting to find out because he said that he was the Messiah, the anointed one. He said that he would rise three days later, but no one raises, raises from the dead. They knew that then. We know that now. That's not a thing that happens. That's not normal. I mean, imagine what must have been going through their minds. They had seen the kingdom of God burst forth into the present through the life of Jesus. The signs, the wonders, the miracles, the teaching, the authority that Jesus had that they said was unlike any authority that they had encountered in earth. They had given up everything to follow him. They had surrendered everything. They had, goodness gracious, they had given up everything that they had their identity wrapped up in to follow this man who they believed was more than just a man. They believed that he was the God-man, Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one in whom all of Israel's promises were supposed to be wrapped up in, and not just for Israel, but for the whole world was to be wrapped up and this anointed one, the Messiah, who would come through the line of Abraham, through the nation of Israel, to be the savior of not just Israel, but the entire world. And here they are wondering, was he just a fraud? Was he a liar? Were we hoodwinked? Were we mistaken? I mean, where does your mind go when you go through a traumatic experience? Where does your mind go when you go through a difficult circumstance? Where does your mind go when you've been gut punched by life and you're uncertain of what's next. Well, we have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the biographies of Jesus' life, and they tell us the life of Jesus, and they include for us what happened after he was put into the tomb. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 20, and we're going to take a look at what John has to say happened that first Easter morning. Starting in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Now when we read that, that's John. He's writing this gospel, this biography of Jesus, and this is a modest way of talking about himself. So she runs to Peter and to John and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb, both of them running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first and stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he didn't go in. And Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there, the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture, he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Wow. The pace of this story. John writes that they ran, that she ran, that they ran. Running happens more times in this one passage than the rest of the gospel of John. There's an urgency here. There's confusion here. Mary Coming to the tomb with others, why can we say it's a, it's a fair assumption that she was with others? Well, verse 2, when she's recounting that they've taken the Lord, she says, we don't know, we, so we can assume there was others with her at the tomb. We don't know where they took him. She comes to the tomb with her friends to anoint Jesus' body, and the stone is rolled away. I mean, think about this. What must have been going through her head? It, wasn't it enough that they killed Jesus wasn't it enough that they gave him a murderer's death? 
and now they can't even dignify him in death? They've stolen his body? Now what in the world is going on? And so she runs and she tells Peter and John, two of the leaders within the friends, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, and they run. And I love what John says about himself in verse nine. He says that when he walks into the tomb and he sees what Peter is seeing, that he believes, but even this belief is not final because the next verse he says, yet we didn't understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. So there's still this sense of confusion. There's still this sense of bewilderment. There's still this sense of, should my morning be turning into anticipation? What's happening here in this moment? And then it just simply says that they went back to their homes. You gotta love this way of processing, right? Every, all of us process differently. And so what they did in this moment was they decided we're packing up shop. I don't even know what to do in this moment. I'm just going back to what I know and that's my home. And so that's where they went. And yet, it says that Mary Magdalene stood there and she stayed there. Who is Mary Magdalene? This is the first time that John is talking about Mary Magdalene. Good news is, because there are four biographies of Jesus, we can color in the story. We know from the other gospels that Mary Magdalene had been healed by Jesus. She had seven demons that he had cast out of her. He had healed her. She, along with other women, joined Jesus in his ministry. She left her responsibilities in her home, breaking cultural mandates, breaking cultural taboos, and following this itinerant rabbi, this teacher, Jesus, around as he ministered to people and the kingdom of God broke forth through him. We also know that she, along with her friends, supported Jesus and the disciples. Not only that, but she was present at Jesus' crucifixion when almost all of his disciples, except John, had left him. She is there watching him hang in agony on the cross. She then sees where he is buried in the tomb. Why does she do that? Because she wants to be able to come back two days, three days later, and she wants to be able to anoint his body to give him a proper burial. Why does she have to wait? Well, because he died on Friday and then Saturday's the Sabbath. That's the day of rest. No work could be done. So she has to wait until the first day of the week, Sunday, to go with her friends to anoint Jesus. And instead of leaving the empty tomb, like Peter and John, she stays. And in verse 11, it says, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Weeping. They process by running, she processes by weeping. Why is she weeping? I mean, think about this. Put yourself in her shoes. Why is she weeping? Can you imagine the emotions that must be coursing through her veins? Confusion, anger, grief, sadness, trauma, pain, I mean, imagine if you had seven demons cast out of you and now the one who cast them out is now dead and perhaps his body has been stolen and desecrated. You might be questioning, was your healing even legitimate? Was your healing even real? Or are you still stuck in the trauma of your past before you even met Jesus? I mean, I don't know, if I was her, I would be wondering, did God somehow fail? Has he not upheld his promises, not just to her, but to the nation of Israel and to, by extension, the whole world? Was God not strong enough? Did he lack the strength? Were his muscles like Pastor Joe's? Was he lacking? You know, the questions that you and I don't give ourselves permission to even ask of God because we feel like to even ask them would be sin. Can you relate to that? I mean, think about that, right? Does God even care? Where is he? Why is he so silent? So think about that. Think about that for you and for me today, for us today. I don't know all of your stories here. You don't know all of my story. But I can tell you one thing that we all have in common here is that we have each been through some stuff. Jesus promised that on this side of eternity that we will have trials and tribulations. That's part of the human experience. And while life is full of joy and blessing and beauty and goodness, 
we also know that too often it is marked by sin and suffering and pain and trauma and loss and grief. I mean, just take this last year, for example, and just pause and reflect for a moment. And I know it can be painful, but pause and reflect for just a moment. Picture the images that you have seen in the news articles and on television. Picture the moments where you've spoken with friends who have shared about how they've lost loved ones throughout this past year. I have friends, I have family members, I have colleagues, I have classmates, all categories. I know people personally who I have sat with and watched them weep because they have lost loved ones. Trauma stacked on trauma stacked on trauma this past year. And wondering the same thing that Mary was wondering. Where's God? Where is he? Does he even care? Can a good God really allow this much suffering? If we can't ask those questions of God, then who are we gonna ask them of? So put yourself here at the tomb with Mary. And you see, she stood weeping outside the tomb and it says, as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? It's almost like, hey, this isn't a place to weep anymore. But she doesn't know that. She said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. I mean, imagine the feverness in her voice, the shakiness in her voice. She still is so confused. Having said this, she turned around and who did she see standing there? She saw Jesus, but she didn't know that it was him. Oh, okay. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. She's still so fixated, still so fixated, rightfully so. She just wants to honor Jesus. That's all she wants to do. Not knowing that he's standing right in front of her. (laughs) And you see, it's as she stoops down, physically showing us the heart posture that God invites us to have, one of stooping low, one of humility, a humble heart, seeking God out, asking him to make himself known to us. And it's through her tears, through her tears. Notice Peter and John didn't have this experience. We're not told why, but it's through her tears that she has this divine encounter. Through her weeping, through her honesty, through her trying to process through the trauma rather than allowing the trauma to process through her. And it's in the moment of her deepest pain, wrestling through her past and her present, that God meets her and that God meets you and me. And what is this about her mistaking Jesus as the gardener? What's happening here? She's so wrong, right? John even tells us it's Jesus, but she doesn't yet know it. She's so wrong, and yet she's so right. Why can she be both at the same time? (laughs) Isn't that a logical contradiction? No. Because the allusions to Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are ripe in this passage. How did it start out the first day of a new week? How did it start out? There was darkness. How did it start out? In a garden where there's going to be the tomb in the garden. How did Genesis 1 start out? 1 and 2. God burst forth light out of darkness. He brought forth order out of chaos. He then created Adam and Eve and he planted them in a garden. And he said, I want you to work the land. I want you to till it. I want you to keep it. I want you to take my definition of beauty, of truth and goodness, and I want you to Edenize the whole earth. I want you to rule and reign with me on my behalf. And then they epically failed, just like you and I epically failed. And in Genesis 3, after they had taken the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happens? God comes knocking at the door and he's asking a question. Where are you? And here in the garden, the new Adam, the final Adam, 
the last Adam, the God-man Jesus, encountering Mary in a garden, and this time he's asking, who are you seeking? It's ripe here. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, she still doesn't know who he is, and he says to her name, her name Mary. And at hearing your name, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my God. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. It wasn't until he said her name. It wasn't until he said her name. You know what, friends? Jesus is calling your name. Jesus is calling my name. And if we already know him, he's still calling our names, inviting us to walk with him each and every day, desiring to cultivate the soil until the soil of our souls that he might bear an abundance of fruit in your life and in mine because he's that good and he's that kind and he's that gracious. And this what is, what's going on here with him telling Mary to not cling to him? It's not a bad thing. Notice she's not offended by this. He's just trying to show her this is a new relationship that we're gonna have. See, because my mission isn't finished yet. Why? Because we know, as we just saw, that he needed to ascend and sit down and get seated on his throne to rule and reign and so that he might send the promised Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who brings light out of the darkness of our own hearts, life out of the death of our own souls, new creation out of the old creation in which we once walked. And then he says, go and tell, go and tell. And Mary Magdalene becomes the first person to encounter the risen Jesus. She becomes an apostle to the apostles, a sent one to the sent ones. She's the first one to interact with him. The first one he chooses to reveal himself to. It's just beautiful. So what does this mean for us? As we come with the trauma and the pain of our past and of this past year, well, Mary sets forth a pattern for us. So bring the pain of your past and the pain of your present and follow the pattern here. Bring it to the cross and weep. And know that he has died for you. Bring it to the tomb and rejoice. The place of death has become the place of life because he's been raised for you. Bring your pain of your past and your present to the gardener of your soul and listen because he's calling your name inviting you into deeper intimacy with himself. Bring your pain. Notice what Jesus said. All throughout John's gospel, he said, the father or my father, and now he says, go and tell the disciples, your father, your God. Something has been completed on the cross. So bring the pain of your present and the pain of your past to your father and trust him, knowing that he's cared for you and he's caring for you now. And finally, bring the pain of your past, bring the pain of your present, bring it to your God and rest. Why? Because when Jesus hung on the cross and right before he breathed his last, John recounts his words. He said, it is finished. May we rest in his finished work. That was my fault, not theirs. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Joe, for that encouragement. Dealing with the, the rough year, year and a half that we've had. Um, you know, before this, we were talking as pastors is, you know, just kind of the flow of things, wanting things to run smoothly this morning. And we said, okay, well, you know, let's make sure that we come onto the stage from one side and, and leave on the other side, and it'll just be smoother that way. But we didn't plan on the tomb being there. And I was half tempted to come out, but then I thought, mm, not, not, the best, not the best play. 
I'm going to leave that one to Jesus or Brandon Anderson who played Jesus. He did a great job. But guys, when we look at the, the life of Mary Magdalene as Pastor Joe was, was leading us and you see the past that she had and you start to think, man, okay, Jesus welcomed all types of people. And where Pastor Joe is landing on that element of, of bringing your pain, bringing your trauma, bringing your past, anything, bringing all of those things to the Lord. But I want us to take a step back for a second because you might not be ready to do that. You might be in the middle of wrestling. You might be in the middle of that, of that struggle. And that's what I want to talk about. So if you, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke 24. And in Luke 24, we see a, another story of a couple of Jesus' followers that were still trying to figure out how this all was going to play out. After Jesus had died and they're there waiting for this grand moment of redemption, and it's not coming and they're wondering, okay, what are you doing, God? Because you said this is how you were going to do things. You said that you were going to win. But you're, you're dead. Did, did you make a mistake? Did you mess up? Asking those questions, those same questions that Pastor Joe was talking about. Now let's look together at Luke 24, starting in verse 13. And we got a good chunk of verses here. But don't worry, we want to look at the big picture. All right, starting in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened, everything that they had experienced, because Jewish men, they traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover. So they were there to experience that final week of Jesus' life, that triumphant entry. The, the Lord's Supper, all of these different things. They've experienced all of the teaching leading up to his arrest and his crucifixion. So they're discussing all of these things. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Now, you realize at this point, Jesus had been listening to their conversation for a little bit. And they don't know who this is. Can, guys, I firmly believe we were created in the image of God, and I'm sure a lot of you believe that as well. But I want to encourage you with something. Just a little side note. Enjoy the word. We have a sense of humor because God has a sense of humor. And that's okay. Okay. Jesus was not this stoic, like, come, worship me. He, was, he enjoyed life, literally, the life of the party, the first recorded miracle. He turns water into wine. We're not going to get into whether or not that was alcoholic wine, fermented wine. Calm down. We're not going there this morning. But I want you to look at this passage and think about this for a second. These two guys are on this seven-mile trip, okay? And the average human being walks three miles an hour, two and a half hours. They're walking. And a, a, at least for a few minutes, this guy they don't know is just walking with them. Just random guy walks up. Like, that's kind of creepy. And it's really strange. I mean, my wife, she's way less comfortable in big cities than I am. But even still, walking around Baltimore City, New York City, Philly, whatever it might be, if you're coming and you're walking in one direction and you have that really awkward realization that like you're going in the same pace with a complete and total stranger, you're like, all right, I, either I need to slow down or speed up because we can't just walk side by side not acknowledging, not acknowledging each other for the next few blocks. It's just strange. It's like that... that Kind of that creepy person that just inserts themselves into a conversation without actually like saying, hey, how you doing? They just walk up and just stand there. So what are you guys talking about? And if you're wondering like, well, I don't know anybody like that. It's because it's you. <laughs> but, but no, no, but I have to do that. Working with students, they're always talking and joking about something, especially at youth group. I just got to walk up and join the conversation like, hey guys, what's going on? And they're like, we don't want to talk about this with you here. Can you walk away? <laughs> but you have this kind of awkward encounter that transforms into this beautiful moment. So let's jump back into verse 17. 
And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? He's walking with them, listening for a little while, not saying anything. Again, a little creepy. Verse 18, then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does, who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? It just kind of adds to how weird this encounter is. He's walking with them maybe, you know, half a mile or so, not saying anything. And all of a sudden he's like, so what's, so what's the big news? What? And they're like, really? You haven't, you've, you're coming from Jerusalem. You really missed out on everything that was going on. And they're, they're almost stunned. They're almost stunned in that moment, verse 19. And he said to them, what things? And at this point, come on, this is, this is just funny. Jesus is like, no, no, tell me what I miss. I, I wasn't there. Shh. Tell me, tell me what I miss. What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified. This just went from creepy to really dark. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Now, this guy, Jesus, they didn't recognize he was Jesus, but he had no idea what three days meant. But it was significant enough to these two disciples to go, hey, we knew what the plan was, but it's not happening. So what has gone wrong? What has gone wrong? Verse 22, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had, been, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive, Mary Magdalene being one of them. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And at this point, you've got to think that these guys are looking at each other going, what? I thought he had no clue what was going on. How is it he knows all this? And they're starting to kind of like, who is this guy we've been walking with for the last two hours? And look at how their mood shifts. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. They had completed those seven miles. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he had opened to us the scriptures? And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So when they finally sit down together, when they finally sit down together and they see Jesus kind of in a similar scene, a similar element, this is the original, this is where the, the phrase hindsight is twenty twenty. this is where it came from, not really, but I like to think so. But they look back on what they had experienced in this conversation that they were having and going, how, how did we miss this? Why were we not overcome with emotion as we're trying to process this? But let's take it one step further. This is, this is pretty bad. You think, of, especially for me, I'm, I'm horrible with names, but I'm, better with, I'm pretty good with faces. But like, it's, it's pretty rough when you go to like a family reunion and you're like, I have no clue who that person is. And I spend half the party trying to figure it out and then I realized, like, oh, it's my second cousin's, like, 
boyfriend, it's like, oh, they're not actually family. Okay, I feel a little better. I'm not this horrible person. Cleopas, there's only one other mentioning of Cleopas, and it's in John 19. And it says that Jesus was there on the cross, and there was the mother of Jesus, her sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, or Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So one of the two, and the other person potentially being his wife, as they were traveling together, but one of the two people on this journey returning home is his uncle, and he doesn't recognize him. And every year for Passover, as all Jewish men would do, they would travel to Jerusalem. They probably had meals together through the years. Remember, Jesus was in his early 30s. They had several decades of getting to know Jesus. And now they're walking this road, walking through this journey, and they don't even recognize him. They don't even picture it. And yet hindsight's 2020. They see him in this similar setting, and the light bulb goes off, and they say, oh, how did we miss this? And look at their reaction. That night, they book it the seven miles they just finished traveling. They book it back to Jerusalem to tell everybody, hey, guys, you won't believe what just happened. You know how we were all worried about God's plan and kind of questioning what the heck was he doing and what's going on? He just explained it all to us, and he walked us through Psalms, and he walked us through Isaiah, and he walked us through Genesis, and he walked us through Moses' life and all of the Torah, and he talked with us about how all of these different ideas of who we thought the Messiah would be, guys, we had it so wrong. But hindsight's twenty twenty. That's really a bad, we need to change that phrase after the 2020 we've had. <laughs> You're going to have to change the spectrum of how we identify good vision just to avoid 2020. <laughs> but I, wanna, I want us to think about this. You know, we've used this phrasing before here at Genesis, we use the terminology of a journey, that you're on this journey with the Lord. All at different places. And that what we hope for you is that you would be taking those next steps in your journey with the Lord. And you think about the, the experiences that Cleopas, whoever this other person was, and all of his followers that they had in the past week, over the past couple of years, serving with Jesus, walking with him, listening to his teaching, starting to buy in to who he was, who he is. And then thinking, where's this, where's this leading? Where's this going? And as I said, you might not be ready to release that pain because you're still on that seven-mile walk. You haven't gotten to dinner yet. You haven't gotten to dinner yet. You haven't gotten to that place where you're sitting down and going, I get it. Now I get it. See, sometimes when you're on a hike, when you're on a hike, you can't really appreciate and understand the depth of the valley you were in until you get to the summit. Until you get to the the waterfall, the view at the top. And you might still be on that height. You might still be on that seven-mile journey. Thinking, man, wh why did this happen? Just as Cleopas and this other person, as they were talking, they, as Jesus asked, why are you so sad about this? What? And they hadn't seen it yet. They hadn't realized it yet. And you might be in the middle of that walk, that experience of going, God, why... Why is my anxiety higher than it's ever been? Why is it when my hands are on the wheel driving to work in the morning, I'm just, I'm kind of asking, like, would it really be that bad if I just swerved off the road? Why is it that I can't bring myself to eat 
because when I look in the mirror, I'm so dissatisfied with my weight. God, why did you allow this depression to come over me? God, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why are you doing this? What was the plan in this, God? Where was this leading? Because your word talks about glory. Your word talks about life everlasting, that he comes to give life and life abundantly. But I'm not, I'm not seeing it. And you might not be seeing it because you haven't made it to dinner yet. You're still on that seven mile walk. And that's okay. You wanna know why? Because Cleopas, whoever his traveling companion was, they had to do that walk at least twice a year, if not more. We have to go on these journeys. We have to go on these long treks multiple times through our lives. And if you haven't heard this saying before, maybe this is the first time you're hearing it, that you're either going into a valley, you're either currently in a valley, or you're coming out of one. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news. And I wouldn't put this on a fortune cookie. Life sucks. But God is so, so good. Romans 8.28, maybe a verse you've heard before, but I want to kind of put it in context. Romans 8.28 and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. God works all things together for good. Which means the depression and the suicide that I, and the thoughts of suicide that I experienced, God worked them together for my good, but I couldn't see it when I was still on the journey. I had to wait till I got to dinner. The struggles with pornography, I didn't understand it then, but I can see it now that I've gotten to dinner. The disappointment, the heartache, the betrayal, the trauma, any of the different seasons in and out of my life, I couldn't see it then. But hindsight's twenty twenty. I could see it once I got to dinner. What I love about Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good. Verse 18, just before that, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He says God works all things together for good in the middle of a moment of suffering. You want to know why he can say that with confidence? Because he's seen God do it before. And you might not see it right now, but I guarantee you there have been moments that God has worked in your life before. And you might be in the middle of that seven mile journey right now, but wait till you get to dinner. And I want you to think about this, just to put things in a little bit more perspective. These are the things Paul experienced, and he lists them in 2 Corinthians 11. And it says, in labors more abundant, in stripes beyond measure, in prisons more frequently, face death often. These are all things Paul experienced. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. He experienced the beating that Jesus experienced five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of water. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil. In sleeplessness often. In hunger and thirst. In often fasting. In cold and nakedness. Besides these things, he struggled with anxiety. He was fearful for the churches he was trying to minister to. Given a thorn in the flesh, abandoned by his friends while he was imprisoned, and he despaired even his own life. He struggled with depression. That's the guy saying he works all things together for good. Why? Because he's seen it happen. 
And I'm begging you to look back on your life and look. And if you look and God grants you with that 2020 hindsight vision, you show up to dinner and you go, wow, I might be on that seven mile road right now, but I know he's gonna get me to dinner. I know he's gonna bring me to that place where I can finally see it and go, it makes sense, I get it. It might take years. But if he is faithful and just, he works all things together for good according to those who love him. So if you're in that place where you're ready to lay up before him, then do that. But if you're stuck, if you're on that seven mile journey, what do you need to do? You just keep walking. You keep traveling and you hope and pray for dinner time. When God is going to reveal himself to you again, give you that 2020 hindsight vision, and you're going to go, Now I get it. Now I see what he was doing. And I promise you this it's going to be the best meal you ever had. After that meal, Cleopas and the other disciple, they run back. After you have that 2020 hindsight vision, you gotta run. You run to your workplace, you run to your family, you run to your church to share that good news. John 21 introduces us to a man that we're very familiar with, and his name's Peter. Uh, we're all familiar with him because we probably have lived like him at one point or another. And so in John chapter 21, I want to look at Peter's uh, past, his present, and future. Because this morning, as we think about this Easter morning, we'll be able to leave this building realizing that God has something for each of us. When we look at Peter's life, we see him sometimes putting his foot in his mouth. Sometimes Jesus is rebuking him pretty sternly. And now we see Peter in a place where it wasn't going well. But a forgiving God came to Peter, and Peter was greatly used by God. I want to encourage you today, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, God has a desire for you to go forward. God has a desire for you to serve him. So let's jump right in here, and let's look at Peter's life, and let's begin with his past position. Peter's past position is in John's Gospel, chapter 18, verses 17 and 18. And so he went out bearing his cross to the place of Golgotha. And then when we go back into chapter 18 and we look at Peter, we find that before Jesus went out, the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples. And here we find that Peter is standing with those outside. He did not follow Jesus in. Peter got to the place where one day in his life he said, Lord Jesus, I will never deny you. And Jesus said, before that rooster crows, you are going to deny me three times. And so we find here in the scripture that Peter was standing and warming himself. When I look at Peter's life and I try to analyze that from a counseling end, I see a man who was very fearful. Like him and like you and me sometimes, we become very fearful. And Peter didn't know what to do. Fearful people sometimes need to have a little bit of control. They need to know what's going on around them. They need to know what an outcome might be. And so, so they maneuver and they plot and they plan to get some kind of control. So when I see Peter here, I see Peter as a fearful man who is standing close and standing around those to see what might be next. He was not going to follow Jesus as Jesus would be taken into that place of torture, into that place of questioning, uh, into that place where he was going to be tried. Peter was going to stand on the outside. And then when you look at chapter 18 and verses 25 to 27, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. 
So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it and the rooster crowed. And immediately Peter realized what he had done, what Jesus said he would do. He denied the Lord. When I think about your life and my life today, when I think about how we sometimes get wrapped up in those things, whether it's fear or worry or anxiousness or panic attacks or, or whatever it might be, we're trying to control things in our own strength. We're trying to control it in our own effort. And we find ourselves in a situation where it gets worse and worse. When I look at this portion of scripture here, I see that Peter vocalized his heart with his words. I know not that man. I am having nothing to do with that man. Out of the heart, Jesus said, come the issues of life. Fear was coming out of Peter, and Peter's words were, I do not know who this person is. We not only see that in what we say, but also in our actions. Peter would not follow Jesus. Peter stayed back. He was at a distance. He thought he might be safe with the crowd. He thought he might be safe standing by the fire, warming his hands. Peter's very action showed where his heart was. And not only that, we find that Peter, his agitated feelings showed where his heart was. As he was questioned, and you read all of the four Gospels, Peter got to the point where he cursed. He was so angry, his feelings took over, and he just cursed and said, I do not know this person. Now, when I look at that, it's easy to preach a sermon about how bad Peter was. But if I look in the mirror, sometimes I can do the same things. Sometimes I can be like Peter in my life where, God, I'm going to promise you this. God, I'm going to do that. God, I'm going to go this way. Lord, I'm going to follow you. And then when it gets a little tense, and maybe the crowd that opposes Jesus is getting a little bit bigger, it's so easy to fall back like Peter did. Well, maybe I won't say anything at work about Jesus. Maybe I won't talk to my neighbors about Jesus because they seem to be party people. Maybe I'll just be quiet when people get agitated, what they call religion. And so we find ourselves just like Peter. We find him in a place where we can easily let our feelings, let our words, let our actions deny the Lord. It's so interesting in one of these portions of scriptures, it says your accent betrays you. They knew he was a Galilean and yet he would uh, vehemently say, no, I do not know him. No, you got it all wrong. You got this whole thing wrong. Regardless of what my accent is, I have nothing to do with this man. And then when we look at the word of God, and I'm just going to refer to Luke chapter 22, verse 61, the beginning of that verse says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Did you ever disappoint someone? And you know they disappointed, you disappointed them because when they turned and they looked at you, you saw their face. Parents, you know, we sometimes have that face, kids, Maybe you know mom and dad don't need to say anything, but in that moment when you do something wrong, they just look at you and you know you disappointed them. Can you imagine as Peter would finally deny the Lord Jesus and Jesus would turn to have Jesus turn and to look right at Peter. And Peter knew what he did and Jesus knew what Peter did. When I look at that portion of scripture, I just want to encourage you today. I don't know what you have done. I don't know what you have done, but I know that in our past, as we look at our lives, whether it's yesterday, whether it's a week from now, whether it's a year ago, whether it's five years ago, we all can look and say, I have a past like Peter. I have not lived up to what Jesus wanted me to do. I have not spoken up for Jesus like he wants me to do. My past, I have allowed to follow me. And in following me, I have made decisions to where I am just like Peter. 
Folks, my hope today is that as we look at Peter's past, we are going to walk out of here and be encouraged. You say, well, Pastor Bob, when's the encouragement coming? It's coming right now in John chapter 21 with the present challenge that Peter is given. John chapter 21, verses 17 uh, to uh, 15 to 17. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. When I look at this portion of scripture, I now gain hope as a believer. I now gain hope knowing that my relationship with Jesus Christ can be different today. Starting today, your relationship can be different with Jesus Christ. I know that God can forgive your past. I know God can forgive you and God can begin to help you and work with you to clean up that past. Peter is a living example of a man who denied the Lord Jesus Christ. He denied him three times and Peter said... Lord, I now love you, as Jesus asked him those questions. Jesus was willing to give Peter the opportunity to have a present challenge to live for him. I want to encourage you on this Easter morning that right now in your seat, as you allow God the Holy Spirit to work in your life, you are able to say to God, I have been like Peter. Lord, I've not been the kind of person who would honor you and respect you and follow you. Lord, I have gone my own way. Lord, I have made my decisions. I have stayed at a distance, Lord. But today is the day I want to come home, Lord. I want to be like Peter today. I want to challenge today, Lord. I want to hear you say that I am useful again. Folks, I want to encourage you this morning that the greatest thing about our Lord Jesus Christ is not only his power to forgive, but his power to use people again. And I am so glad that in this auditorium and people watching on live stream, I just want you to know that on this Easter morning, God gives hope to you. God has a place for you to serve him. You can come back. You can get rid of that past. You can begin to make amends. You can begin making restitution. You can begin a process that is going to glorify God. We find that and we see that. Here is Peter. And God says to Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to feed my sheep. I was saying to the pastors this week, I met with them. And I was starting as I was studying this passage of scripture. The one thing that God showed me is that as a lead pastor, I got to make sure I shepherd my staff. I got to make sure I be that kind of shepherd that is going to help them and move them along. And I said to those pastors, I want to be there to that place of shepherding you. I want that team of eight that I work with. I need to shepherd them so they can begin to shepherd their staff so we all can shepherd you. I thought this week that the thing about Genesis Church that will make us successful and make you feel like you're moving forward is if we all become shepherds on some level. If we all come to the place where we care about each other, where we're going to walk with each other, where we're going to stand beside each other, and we're going to shepherd each other, and we're going to care for each other, and we're going to stop knocking people down, we're going to begin picking them up. And that's what's exciting. When I look at Psalm 23, and you know Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. You are with me, your rod, your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
when I need to learn how to be a good shepherd, I go to the good shepherd. I want to encourage you and me that we walk together as a church and a body of people because this world needs good shepherds. This world needs good shepherds. You can be a good shepherd. Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Feed my sheep. God says to us today, I am risen. I am alive. And I am sending you to be my shepherds, to care for people, to reach people. Somebody the other week, we were talking as I finished a message. I was walking up the aisle and, and they, they stopped me and, and, and they made a comment. And it was a positive comment. But they said something I haven't forgotten. So wherever you're sitting out there, in fact, it was our drummer this morning who said it. He looked at me and he said, one thing about a shepherd, they smell like the sheep. You know, that may not have been much in our little conversation we had, but I never forgot that. I never forgot that. And I was, as I was looking at this portion of scripture, the one thing that I need to remember as your pastor, I need to be where you are. We're in this together. There's no pedestal for me. There's no place of hierarchy for me. The shepherd is among the sheep. And so we serve together. And so Jesus says here, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to do that. I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you that you and I, as followers of Jesus on this resurrection morning, we'd start to put behind us all the things we hear people fight about and argue about out there in the world. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody posts their opinion. Everybody has something to say. The one thing we need that we don't have a lot of are shepherds. We need shepherds. Shepherd your neighborhood. Shepherd your family. Shepherd your uh, a place of work where employees come to you and they have questions about God or, or maybe they're struggling and they need someone to walk beside. Be that shepherd who's out there in all the mire the sheep is when you, when you pick that sheep up that's all messed up because that sheep got caught in the briars. That sheep was about to fall off the cliff. Let it be your rod of the shepherd that reaches down and pulls them up. We see the good shepherd. Jesus says to Peter, yes, I know you denied me. Yes, Peter, I turned and I looked at you. But Peter, you repented bitterly. You cried. You repented. You want to do the right thing. I'm not going to let you lay in your tears. I'm going to send you to those who are going to be my sheep. God wants to challenge you and me to live a life of shepherding. When I think about this portion of scripture, I go to Acts chapter 14. And in Acts chapter 14, we read in that portion of scripture uh, where, or excuse me, Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. But Peter standing with the 11. Now, if you've known me long enough, and I have probably said at least sometime this year, I love just that little phrase right there. Because when I read that phrase that Peter is now standing up, I remember when Peter was laying down in his tears. When Peter thought that Jesus wanted him no more, Peter became the first pastor of the New Testament church. When God called Peter and Peter repented and God said, I want you to feed my sheep. He gave Peter, this man who could live in his past and look, always look at himself as a failure. He turned and said, God, I believe you've forgiven me. Jesus, I know you want to use me. And Jesus says, I got a job. I want you to stand up on the day of Pentecost and I want you to preach my word. And that man who cried alone led thousands to Christ. God wants to do the same thing with you today. Wherever you are in your spiritual walk, God wants to give you the opportunity to serve him again. This church is about people who want to change. This church is going to walk beside people who want to change. I am not worried what you're coming out of. I'm concerned where you're going. I am not worried that you would say, Pastor Bob, you don't know my past. If I start to tell you, do you still want me? Yes, we do, because Jesus wants you. 
and as his shepherds and as this church, we want you do never do not ever think that you have to you have to stay outside these doors. Don't ever think that you have no place at any table. Because this church is changing how it treats people who are hurting. And we are going to move to the people whose lives need help. We are going to move to the people who are destitute. We're going to move to the people and toward the people and love the people who need a Savior that we might introduce them to Jesus Christ. And so here in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, we see Peter is now preaching. When you go back to John chapter 21, we see another thing that Jesus says to Peter, and it's about his martyrdom. About his martyrdom. In John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19, truly I say to you that when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this to show by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And after that saying, he said to him, follow me. What death did Peter die? We are told by church history that Peter was crucified. But it's interesting because Peter did not feel he was worthy of his Lord. And in his crucifixion, he was crucified upside down. Jesus told Peter here in this proverb, right now you are moving about, but someday someone is going to stretch out your hands. And it was signifying that death that Peter would die. Peter was willing to give up his life for Jesus Christ. And then Jesus says about future opportunities, he says to Peter, keep on following me. You follow me. I want to encourage you as we close this morning, I want to encourage you that wherever you are, God is willing to meet you right now. If you're watching from home, God is willing to meet you right now where you're watching. If you're sitting in this auditorium, God will meet you right here. We want to come alongside of you and help you. And the only way you can do that is if you let us know. Now, maybe you want to talk to someone at the welcome area. Maybe you want to talk to me down front here or Pastor Brandon or Pastor Joe. Uh, there are people around, Pastor Jeff. There are people around that you can talk with. I just want to encourage you that when you make that decision to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I want to be used by you. On this resurrection Easter Sunday morning, I am using this and I am laying down this marker this Easter morning as my first step to move forward. Let us know that because we want to help you. We want to be beside you. We want to walk with you. We want to tell you the truth. Jesus said to Peter, follow me. But Jesus told him the truth. Someday, Peter, as you follow me, you'll die for me. Jesus did not tell him the truth. We'll walk beside you, regardless of how muddy your waters are this morning. We'll walk with you. We'll put on our boots and walk with you. But we'll always tell you the truth from the word of God and what God says. So this morning, you've heard a lot about people you heard about Mary Magdalene. You heard about these guys on the Emmaus Road. And you heard about Peter. I hope today that as you think through this Easter day, you might think about where you are and you might realize that God wants you to be in a better place. And I pray that you will come and let us help you to accomplish that goal.